Okay, so welcome to this session in our Situation Room, which is uh, a new room here at the WEF, where we have this incredible graphic screen that we're going to be utilizing throughout the session today on growth and prosperity. And um, my name is Rana Faruhar. I'm an associate editor and global business columnist for the Financial Times. Uh, I'm going to be moderating this session. We're going to have a lot of information, a lot of graphics, an interesting discussion with the panelists that I'll introduce in just a moment. And then we're also going to have question time for you all. Um, so let me just set the stage here. Um, first of all, this is on the record. It's going to be streamed, uh, so you should know that. Um, and we're going to be using graphics throughout. And you can certainly request if you have uh, ideas that you want us to try and pull up on screen. The question is essentially how to balance economic growth and environmental degradation. We've had incredible economic growth in the last several decades, but we are also at a crisis point, as everyone here knows, um, with the environment. And so this session is going to be about how we balance those two things and everything that comes in between. Um, one of the great things we're going to be able to do with the graphics here, um, which is um, uh, going to be run uh, by our graphics wizard, uh, Ila Nurbakash. Did I get the surname correct? <laughs> Perfect. A professor at the Robotics Institute of Carnegie Mellon. Um, we're going to be layering different um, uh, data sets on top of one another, uh, trade, environmental degradation, jobs, technology, et cetera, and trying to kind of create a graphical um, map of where we've been and where we might be going. So let me take one minute and just set the stage with a couple of facts, and then I'm going to introduce the rest of our panelists. Um, on, Oct excuse me, on August 2nd of 2017, we overshot the resources that the Earth naturally replenishes. So that's a big, big uh, tipping point. At the current consumption rates, we need 1.7 planets worth of resources to meet humanity's needs. Not good. Um, that means that we are emitting essentially more carbon than the oceans and forests of the world can absorb in a year. Uh, we caught more fish, felled more trees, harvested more, and consumed more than the Earth could actually sustain. And this is an ongoing trend, and the environmental impact of this is beginning to show, as we're going to see in some of the graphics. Uh, at the same time, we have huge wealth inequality and huge bifurcation. Again, something that everybody that's come to WEF is familiar with. Um, the top 1% holds over 50% of the world's wealth. I believe that's an Oxfam stat. And the world's eight richest people have equivalent wealth to the poorest 50%. So a lot of imbalances here. And we're going to talk about how we've gotten to this place and what some of the solutions might be. So um, before we go any further, let me just introduce the rest of our panelists here. Uh, Professor Ken Rogoff from Harvard. Professor Lin um, from, let's see, I'm going to, Shanmen University, did I get that right? And Kate Rayworth, um, who is just a self-described renegade economist uh, <laughs> from the University of Oxford. She's in charge of the Environmental Change Institute there. Um, so Kate and Ela are going to present and tell us a little bit about the various data sets, and then we're going to jump into conversation. So take it away. Great. Hello, everybody. I would like to introduce you to a compass for the 21st century. And silly though it sounds, it looks a little bit like a donut. So the hole in the middle is a place where people are falling short on life's essentials, where people don't have the food, healthcare, education, housing, <coughs> energy, incomes that every person has a claim to. These are actually sourced from the Global Sustainable Development Goals. Those are social priorities of the SDGs. We want to get everyone in the world out of that hole in the middle, into the green donut itself. But, and it's a very big but, we cannot overshoot our pressure from the outer edge of this, because there we put so much pressure on this extraordinary, unique, dynamically, delicately balanced planet that we begin to kick it out of balance. We cause climate breakdown, acidify the oceans, catastrophic biodiversity loss. And these are the nine planetary boundaries first drawn up in 2009 by Johan Rockström, Steph Will Stefan, and a group of leading Earth system scientists. So in the simplest of terms, I'd say this is a compass for meeting the needs of all within the means of the planet. But if I offer that to you as a compass, you want to know where the needles are pointing. And it's not a pretty picture. Because on every one of those social foundations, millions or billions of people are falling short. One person in three worldwide doesn't have access to a toilet. One person in 10 has no access to clean water. One person in 10 doesn't have enough food to eat every day. But on every one of these dimensions, people are falling short on life essentials. 
And yet already we have overshot at least four of these planetary boundaries on climate change, excessive fertilizer use of nitrogen and phosphorus, massive biodiversity loss, and converting too much of Earth's surface for human use. We don't even know where we are at a global scale on air pollution and chemical pollution. So this is a picture of humanity and our living world. This is our selfie. And I believe it's our generational challenge to turn this picture around. I believe this is what our children's children will remember us, the people of the early 21st century, for. Did we begin to turn this story <coughs> around? Because we're the first generation to ever see this picture. I show this to many, many groups, and I invite them to say, what do you think are the big determinants of whether or not we can turn this around and meet the needs of all within the means of the planet? And two things come up time and again population growth and economic growth. And I want to take on both of those because I think they tell very different stories and only one of them keeps me awake at night. So, population growth. This map takes us from 2000, where are we gonna go? From 2014 to 2016. And we can see global population growth. Yes, the human population is growing. And in the 1970s, they said it was like a population bomb, explosive increase. We can see it's growing all over the world at different rates in different countries. But there's a good news story here. Because for the first time in human history, the world's population growth rate is falling, not due to war, not due to famine, not due to disease, but due to success. We know how to bring down the global population growth rate. You invest in child health so children survive. Invest in girls' education women's rights, women's reproductive rights, women's empowerment, and women are empowered to manage the size of their own families. And you can see this happening on this map of fertility rates. So uh, red is higher fertility and going through to pale yellow is low fertility. This is going from uh, 1984 to the present day. And what you can see over time is a real transition in some countries. If we start back in 1984, there we are. A lot of the world is red. High fertility, lots of children per family. If we do shoot to the end, you can see a massive reduction all across Latin America, in China, in many parts of Asia. Still high rates of growth, population growth, in Africa, India, and some parts of Asia. And there's an explanation for why that's still high. And bringing up the vet and that story now that combines the fertility data you just saw, with something else that we have from IHME, which is total deaths due to pollution. And so the larger the purple circle is, the more deaths you have per country due to pollution. But this is a very particular kind of pollution. This is traditional pollution, which means death due to dirty water, death due to lack of a toilet, death due to dying from cooking stove fumes. This is what many children die of, utterly preventable causes like diarrhea, cholera. These are deaths that should not be happening because we have all the technology and ability to eradicate this kind of death. We know that if we tackle that and make children survive, families believe their kids are actually gonna reach the age five. Parents have fewer children. So if we meet people's most essential rights to survival, this is one of the most effective ways of stabilizing that human population growth. We want to orient you to how big this death due to pollution is. And one interesting way to do that is to show you something comparative. So here, what I'm showing you now is the same exact thing, same large circles, but we've overlaid at the same time total deaths due to violence around the world, country by country. So the small pink circles, death due to violence. The large circle, proportional, deaths due to pollution. And I find this fascinating because what you can see, we hear about death due to violence. We <coughs> fear violence, but actually, it's the pollution of the poorest, dirty water, a lack of a toilet, and cooking smoke that is killing the largest number of people by far in so many countries. Brazil, in fact, it's the other way around. But look so much across Africa and Asia, pollution of the poorest is still killing so many people. It's totally preventable. So we know how to tackle this. We know how to enable children to survive so that families choose to have smaller families. We know how to turn what once once thought as a population bomb into something that actually plateaus and levels off. We can tackle and deal with a leveling off of the human growth 
So that I, is not the curve that keeps him awake at night. What keeps me awake at night is economic growth. And this graph shows us growing income, uh, income expenditure across the world. Of course, it's popping up in exactly the opposite places. And this tells us part of that story of inequality in the world. If I had a graph here that I don't have, I'd love to show you, it would be a map of the world's billionaires because not only do we have income growth in richer countries, we have massive bifurcation. This past year has seen the biggest increase in billionaires ever. There are now over 2,000 billionaires in the world. Their fortunes increased by $760 billion in this past year. And they'd be mapped, I call it the billionaire belt, and it goes here from uh, Argentina up across the US, across Europe, down through Asia and lands in Australia. Huge inequality. But even those who aren't billionaires, the growth of income in the world's richest countries, unlike population, which is tending to a plateau, the challenge here is that our countries, our economies, have been structured politically, financially, and socially to expect, demand, and depend upon unending GDP growth. We hear it all the time in the news. It's the focus of politicians' attention and media attention. How is GDP doing? The dream, of course, is that we can see green growth. We can see sufficient, absolute decoupling of that endlessly growing income from impacts on the environment. But if you look at the data, it isn't happening on anything like the scale that is required or hoped for. We have not seen anything like the evidence of sufficient, absolute decoupling that would be required to make this kind of endless income growth compatible with coming back within planetary boundaries. And in fact, if we look at where these countries' resource use is coming from, here is exports of soy from Brazil, exports of palm oil from Indonesia. You can see, of course, that when we think about deforestation in Brazil, in Indonesia, we think about those locations, but where is that pressure coming from? The pull is, again, coming back to these worlds, many of the world's richest countries, to so having a direct global footprint on deforestation. This is the first time this data has been added to the database. And I think it's fantastically powerful to see that interconnection of global resource flows. So let's zoom into Brazil and see what that actually looks like on the ground. What we're going to show you in Brazil is we're going to start in 1984 with Landsat satellite imagery that shows you exactly what the Earth looks like if it were cloud-free in 1984. And overlaid on that, we have protected areas bounded in green. And what you're looking at is virgin Amazonian forest, the biggest carbon sink in the world. As we play this forward in time, what you're seeing is the destruction of that carbon sink. You're seeing deforestation because of exactly the export to trade that you just saw visualized. But there is a piece of news here that's important to realize. This protected area, for instance, where the Jinchu people live, is precisely where the indigenous people, once given protected status, move to the southern edge with pangas in hand and protect their area from deforestation showing the value that policy has in enabling social change on the ground that can help us recover from these situations. But where in all the other areas, not only have communities lost that land, but of course at the global scale, we're seeing massive biodiversity loss due to that deforestation. We're seeing loss of water for cities like Sao Paulo. And of course, we're seeing a release of greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And when we pull back and look at that, that story on the global scale, it's a story we're familiar with, climate change. And what you can see pulsing here, the red, is an, a yearly cycle. I think of it almost like a giant skipping rope that's getting ever more vicious. And this is game we are handing on to our children. Is that what we want to hand our children? A future of pulsing red. That's an extraordinary image to contemplate. But I want to now pull back and end by focusing on what I think is one of the most important maps. Because in this image, Every spot, every light you can see is a city. And in every city, there's a university. And in every university, there's an economics department. And I think one of the questions we have to ask is what is being taught to the next generation of students about what economics is and is for? What is prosperity? What is success? How do we understand the role of an economy, the boundaries of an economy and its interaction with the living world? Today, economists still talk about the living planet and its degradation in terms of environmental externalities. When I hear that language, I say, we can already tell there's something wrong with the theory if we're talking about the living world on which we depend as an externality. You see, way back in ancient Greece, it was Xenophon who coined the term economics, and it means 
The Art of Household Management. And when Xenophon wrote this tract 2,000 years ago, he was talking about the management of a single household, a single estate. How do you manage your slaves, your wife, your cloth, your wine? Towards the end of his life, Xenophon raised his sights to the next level up, to the city-state, his hometown of Athens, and he asked the economics of a city-state, allowing foreigners in, imports, exports, taxes. It took 2,000 years for us to raise our sights again because it was when Adam Smith in Scotland took economics to the next level up, not the household, not the city-state, but the nation-state and asked the question in his classic work on the wealth of nations. What is it that makes one nation thrive with an industrial revolution while others seem to stagnate? We've been working with Smith's level of economic analysis, the nation state, for over 250 years, and I believe it's our generation's time to raise our sights one level further. Because ours is the era of the planetary household, and we need a planetary scale economics fit for understanding this extraordinary living world on which we depend, that we know we are currently running down with our endless focus on growth. Thank you. Wow, okay. <laughs> okay, Kate, Ela, you guys are total rock stars. That, um, boy, that really does paint a picture and um, I will not soon forget the palm oil uh, sort of kind of oddly beautiful yet disturbing, you know, moving graphic. Um, all right, so we're going to bring in Professor Rogoff and Professor Lin and kind of broaden the discussion, and you all should feel free to jump in, um, and we can pull up various graphics and suggest others. Um, Professor Lin, I'm going to maybe start with you, and tell me, uh, walk me through, you know, referencing maybe what you've seen, and, and, and we can pull up other graphics how China's development has reflected these trends that we've just seen and where we're going. I mean, I know a lot of economists that I talk to look, um, m you know, more at environmental markers even than, say, monetary or financial mm -hmm. markers to look at is China's development model actually changing? Where is the country going? So maybe you can kind of draw all this together for us. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> let me start with a comment on something that's uh, more fundamental. China, about 30 <coughs> years ago, a little bit more than 30 years ago, we changed from market economy, uh, from planning economy to market economy. That's a big change. Mm. We found an opening up. But, but let me start with uh, thinking about what, what is the market system uh, mm. impact on the resources. In a market system, uh, on the supply side, the most important is to sell. On the demand side, the people's uh, needs are limited. So we buy so much that we really don't need. And that's the base of the systems. I'm not really against the market economy, but I'm just saying that uh, with the market economy, you really have to be very smart mm. to avoid disaster on the, on the natural resources. I'll give China as an example. That. So that for the last 30 years, we had about 10% growth on average. Well, last few years, we go down to about 6 to 7%. But that's still substantial, given the base has been built up you know, so quickly. I still remember that at the beginning of the reform opening up, changing from planning to market economy, China consumed roughly about, about 500 million tons of coal, hmm. a little bit more. What do we have here? Eli? But today, we consume 4 billion tons of coal, even though with the effort of the reducing coal for the last few years. I look at number, last year we consumed 3.9 billion tons of coal. And, and that, that's substantial, not only impact on the resources, it also impact on the, on the, on the, on the environment. And, and that's why that the, the government suddenly realized that uh, uh, we need to, ch something needs to be changed. And of course, that's something to do with the income also. The China's income coming from almost nothing to today average about 8,000. Let me, let me capital. Yeah. stark yeah. visualization yeah. of that is shown here. This is lights at night over the last 25 years. And what you're looking at is in green areas where the number of lights, the amount of electricity used has been stable over the last 25 years. Red are new lights. So what you can see remarkably is the degree to which America is green except for some suburbs in Atlanta. But Poland and China, the entirety of China, has developed in exactly the 25 years that Professor Lin is describing. <coughs> and the 
level of usage that we're talking about overwhelms everything mm. that we're looking at in green on the other side of the map. So Professor Lin, you work with the government on setting economic and environmental policy. When you look at that map, what do you think? Why well, it says that uh, something needs to be changed. Why well, on, the, on the positive side that China is going to become a, you know, a modern economy. Mm. Some, some people even predict that in about 10 years time, China will become a high income country. Mm. That's the positive side. But on the negative side is that uh, we have so much impact on the natural resource and mm. environment. Mm. And if you look at the people have been to Beijing in the last few years, you, you know, you don't see much during the winter time. That's PM 2.5. In fact, Beijing is not the worst place in China. Mm. It's, it's a sensitive place. But if you look at the other cities like in Hebei <laughs> province, in, in, in Anhui province, the city, the, the air pollution is even worse. So, uh, but the good thing is that we, the government realized that the people has a demand, has a price for the environment quality, air quality. So, so China has been changing and changing very quickly. And I believe that it would be a good story to tell that if we have a dynamic looking into the history of the last 30 years and looking forward for another 10 years, let's see what happened in, in Beijing. Mm. That would be a good example to demonstrate that if like, there's a will, we still be able to deal with air pollution. Okay, I'm gonna bring Ken in in a minute, but Ila, first tell us what we're looking at here. One of the important points Professor Lin is making that it's not homogeneous. The pollution challenges that China and India and other places face is highly variegated. Uh, the darker the colors are here, the more the PM2.5 loading, which we know is associated with cardiovascular disease, arrhythmia, uh, childhood obesity, ADHD, and autism. But you can see that the variegation, even within China, is large, and that has to do with the location of plants, and it has to do with the wind direction and topology of the land. Okay, great. Right. So Ken, um, you know, we've seen the U.S. in contrast here a little bit. Um, walk us through how you see the last four or five decades in terms of the trade-offs between growth, the environment, and kind of where we are now. And we may be in a, I mean, hope, hopefully, I shouldn't show my political <laughs> impulses, but a blip uh, policy-wise around how we think about the environment. But uh, what, what, what do you have to say about all this so far? Well, first I want to say the presentation is just magnificent, and it's not just telling us about this topic, but the future of education. Uh, this is you know, something that might actually capture children's attention away from video games. I'm not sure. <laughs> it um, it kind of it's, is a video game, which is cool. No, it's, 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 it's magnificent, magnificent, even if, as Kate ended her speech, I think economists were sort of the... Uh, monsters in this horror movie. The syllabus, the syllabus. <laughs> the syllabus. <laughs> um, the, so, uh, you know, it's funny, you, you mentioned in your opening remarks about how inequality is a piece of this. And I have to say, the inequality that matters here is not the one mm. that everyone keeps mentioning, mm. which is within country inequality, mm. the very wealthy American middle class and French middle class yeah. wanting more. Yeah, yeah. Because by world standards, they're pretty rich. Yeah. They're, if not ten, top 10%, top 15% of the world economy. What the, the real issue uh, that, that's happening is there are countries like China and India where they're pulling up from this awful poverty and uh, that we, we saw magnificent uh, slides of some of that. Mm. And if the U.S. consumption model is supposed to be everybody else's consumption model, which is the baseline that everyone's working around, it doesn't work. It's yeah. not possible. And uh, the U.S. model is, it's not sustainable. It's obscene in a lot of ways. And you, you see it in so many dimensions, these pollution graphics. I don't, I don't know if you have an obesity chart. Of course you do. Um, <laughs> Of, uh, <laughs> of, uh, I'd like to see that with the palm no, of, oil. No, of, 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 of the whole, you know, uh, there are many factors, mm. but the whole, the whole uh, you know, overconsumption and how that yeah, has more resources and we need to change our diets and how we live. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, there, there needs to be a, whole, a wholesale paradigm shift. I mean, we economists like to think that you can think about all of this in terms of economics, that there is a way to translate all of this, then believe it or not, we have courses like that. But that doesn't necessarily translate into a political language. So mm. I don't know if I'm as optimistic as you. Um, certainly, <laughs> I hope that we don't have someone who denies this is true uh, as uh, 
leader uh, of the United States. But at the same time, the big push, even if you look at the other side in the United States, is more consumption, more. There's yeah. nothing about tempering the carbon taxes. The word uh, carbon tax, oh, that's not fair to the people who have big cars. We yeah. shouldn't allow that. So I, I think a carbon tax is a starting point. Um, but the US has to take leadership in this because they can't just say, well, you know, we'll keep our consumption where it is, we'll keep our pollution where it is, and China, you keep your per person pol pollution where it is, and it won't be so bad. We can't say that. I, I was struck by the, the graphic that you showed earlier. I'm, I'm going to uh, not remember which country, but there was a space that where the rainforest had been Brazil. carved. Brazil, yeah. Um, it's interesting because that showed policy can make a difference. So let me ask you, how quickly do you think policy could make a difference if there were a shift in the U.S.? I mean, we're, you know, what are we talking? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, obviously, when you look at wartime and people mm. taking things seriously, mm. policy mm. can change very fast. But I, I, I think, uh, you know, just moving off in a different direction mm. would be very helpful. Uh, I don't even know where to start on that <laughs> question. I mean, honestly, we'll dig in. We'll dig but I, th I think there's a question of moral leadership. Yeah. and the mm -hmm. fact you're not getting it from the United States. And frankly, it even spills over into trade policy. A lot of our trade policy almost promulgates mm. this uh, U.S. consumption mm -hmm. model. Do you want to put up any, uh, another I, I do. slide? I, I'd love to talk <coughs> slightly about nutrition. What's yeah. really interesting about what, what Professor Rogoff's talking about. So obesity and nutritional deficiencies turn out to be really interesting measures hmm. of culture and society and the health of the culture. And indeed, from 1990, to what, 2006, you can see what happens in the United States. That's recent times, right? This is not 50 years ago. And you can also see no improvement in the US since 2006. So we've continued where we are. If we flip this problem on its head and instead show you something else, which is nutritional deficiency going forward, thanks to Oxford Martin, you'll see the exact opposite. You'll see that by 2050, we have massive nutritional deficiencies forecast in Asia and even in Southern Europe because of climate change. This is climate-induced nutritional mortality. So we have a double-edged sword here. We have obesity and nutritional deficiency in our same world because of an imbalance in the way we spend can, and eat. Can you tease that out a little bit more? I mean, talk about what's happening in China. And Professor Lin, jump in mm. if you have anything to say about this. Well, what's happening is that Oxford is looking at models of warming going forward. These are two different RCP metrics for how quickly the Earth warms. And what uh, Oxford was able to evaluate is agricultural practices per country and the degree to which each country will be able to produce agriculturally nutritionally wholesome meals for its citizens. Hmm. And so in red, what you're seeing is the number of additional deaths, mortality, which is about 80,000 people per year in China, this simply due to deficiency in nutrition. I mean, this is making me wonder about food-related conflict. Do you have uh, uh, any graphics around uh, you know, growing conflict and um, scarce resources? Well, while he's looking, I mean, global warming is gonna put incredible mm. pressures on migration. Yeah. What yeah. you're yeah. seeing in Europe now it's nothing yeah. compared to when the Middle East, part, large parts of the Middle East of Africa become uninhabitable. People are desperate to move. Uh, in principle, by the way, according to some research, if you were to be able to move people north, places that weren't habitable become so because of global warming, and it could be not so bad. But we don't have any kind of political framework mm. to allow that. Look at you know what's going on in Europe now. Mm. This is a visualization China. of sea level rise around the world. Yeah. And just briefly looking at Shanghai, what you're seeing is massive decrease in oh, wow. the support structure for humans who are living there today. And if you were mm. to look at Cuba, if you look at uh, fringes and borders in many countries, the arable land that is farmed is precisely what disappears first. Yeah. I think that China is uh, quite uh, quite concerned about the about this. That's why uh, we try very hard on the global, even though there's uh, difficulties. Uh, but we're going to start the common trading Can you dig very in? soon. And if you look at the, this picture, uh, yeah. most of them is down will be in the coastal areas. And those are the major you know, industrial bases uh, and also economic bases for China. You look at Guangdong, Shanghai, mm. you know, those are really where the China economy would be. Uh, I believe there's uh, one picture about Guangdong. Can you look at the Guangdong, please? And uh, basically, that you, you wow. see, you will, you will disappear. And that's what, a, what, per what period is this, by the way? Is it this is four degrees of warming. Four degrees uh, of warming. Four degrees of warming. So, right. yeah. okay. um, uh, and the 
Do you know that the Guangdong economy is pretty much the size of the Russian economy? Hmm. So, uh, you know. So tell us, you know, when you're sitting in these policy meetings in Beijing, no. um, if we can just, um, I know this is kind of alarming. <laughs> no. We'll just keep the, keep the volume down for a minute. Right. Um, when you're sitting in policy meetings in Beijing, and you know, this kind of data is being discussed, what are the solutions that are being talked about and, and how do you balance you know, the need for job creation, uh, the need to support a, a growing white collar workforce um, with, with these issues? Well, at this point, I think the environment will be the number one priority for China. Uh -huh. We actually choose to lower economic growth to roughly 10% to mm -hmm. about 6.7%, and which is a China we really need to do that mm. by looking uh, harder on the environmental standards, uh, by checking into factories uh, of their producing sources every year, several times a year, mm. by changing the coal to electricity to natural gas to extend that. After we're doing it, we find out we don't get enough gas. Okay, so government is trying very hard for it. And most important that China just announced uh, last, last month mm. that we're going to start it officially start carbon trading. Hmm. It's begin to build up the, the momentum. Mm. And the trial running will be in about a year. So I would say trading in about two years time. Yeah. Do you want to jump uh, in? Uh, it, well, uh, one of the major topics here is tech, uh, the blockchain, cryptocurrencies. And a lot of these technologies are phenomenally in energy intensive. Of course, I don't have the New York Times had an article, I think, today about one Bitcoin transaction taking the consumption of an average consumer in a year. Right, yeah. And a lot of the Something AI applications <laughs> are very energy You don't intensive. have a Bitcoin slide, do you, Eli? Yeah. It, it was so too expensive. <laughs> <And> also, <laughs> uh, let me also add a little bit, the big, big data. That's yeah. also very big, big, That's what I meant, yeah. artificial right. intelligence, yeah. big that's data. Right. phenomenally yeah. energy right. intensive. And so we're mapping out this future which doesn't you know jive with what's possible? Right. And, uh, and I also want to comment on that. Uh, even though China try very hard to reduce the coal uh, consumption, but when China economy get out of the cycles, coal comes back. Mm -hmm. This year, so good last news year, is bad news right? Last way. year we have uh, energy incremental, primary energy incremental, incremental three point five percent, as compared to the one percent previously. The coal come wow. back. It's roughly two to three percent in increase after three years continuous decline. Mm. But the coal consumption of being negative is a precondition for China's CO2 to be level up mm. because we know the gas and oil will continue to, to increase, increase substantially. So, so if the coal is not negative, that means the CO2 in China will continue to increase. So okay. let me let me be um, let me be contrarian and be an optimist for just a minute. Um, one thing I, I've always been impressed, actually, in China, the way the government. And I was Im impressed in the last um, sort of communique about technology mm -hmm. and technology planning in the next right. five or ten years, um, uh, how tech development was going to be used to deal with job uh, disruption. Is there also an environmental component? I mean, how how is the government in a really concrete way? knitting together growth opportunities and the environment um, in a way where you don't get that trade-off, where good news is bad news. Well, the, there will be some impact, of course, by increasing environmental quality will be some impact on the, on the industry. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, the new industry, we call the renewables, uh, they created jobs. Mm -hmm. Let's look at, we, I think we can also look at the, the wind and solar in China. What are we looking at yeah. here? Eva? This is uh, what you're going to see here is in uh, blue and pink, you'll see right. total energy production <coughs> by wind and by solar techniques around the world. And you can see back in 2003, almost no production in China of wind and solar. We'll play it forward in time and look at how China catches up and exceeds American levels. Wow. Yeah. Wait, can you bring that back up again? So is China now, in absolute terms, exceeding U.S. in pr production? Oh, that's for levels? sure. Yeah. Uh, we yeah. are number, number one in the world. Yeah. That's for it sure. Looks by, by some margin, it looks like. That's yeah. for sure. Where does India fit into this in terms of its growing energy consumption? It, uh, it increased wind power early. But yeah. solar has been much slower to pick up compared to China. Mm -hmm. I'll yeah. play it through the late 2010s, 11s. And you can see right. China just explodes. In fact, it's what's, the dynamics that are interesting here is that solar became so cheap that even though wind had a head start, 
Right. Solar has actually taken over and overtaken the rate of growth of, of, right. of solar, by, of wind by far. Last year, solar generation in, in China alone increased by 75 percent hmm. in one year. But uh, we plan to install 100 gigawatt of capacity by 2020. But last year, we had 960 gigawatt, well, 96 gigawatt already. Did you want to I just want to say that this transition to renewable energy, when I go back to the donut that I showed at the beginning, yeah. it's a double whammy win because mm. clean energy means no more deaths from cook stoves. Mm. It means households have access to electricity. Kids can actually do their homework, not sitting under a street light, but they can do it at home. It has health benefits. Hospitals have refrigeration. So it, clean energy has so many benefits in terms of getting everybody out of that poverty. And, of course, it brings us back in on climate change, and it has so fewer knock-on effects mm. on the other planetary boundaries. So that this, this energy transition is just a fantastic double win for meeting the needs of all while coming back within the means of the planet. Mm. It's very interesting. Um, you know, I, as I'm thinking about China's growing power renewables, I'm also thinking about tariffs on solar panels. Um, you know, <laughs> Ken's going to keel over in a minute. Um, <laughs> what, is there, is there, uh, let's talk about the trade discussion in this regards and how it could impact, you know, the progress that's being made. Ken? Well, I mean, <clears throat> since the president doesn't believe in climate change, he doesn't seem to worry that banning solar power, mm -hmm. you know, making solar power more expensive in the United States is meaningful and I don't even know where to go with that. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I will just say it's a bit of a tangent, but I'm, I'm hoping his bark is bigger than his bite yeah. on trade negotiations. But the climate denial is a much bigger issue. Mm -hmm. Remember, he came on, let's bring coal back. Yeah. Let's get those coal miners back to work. At, anyway. what do you, oh, go ahead, Kate. Can I just say that, that yeah. this, this national, uh, nation first, climate second, it's stuck at the level of Adam Smith nation mm -hmm. as the economy and it's exactly that leap that we're failing to make i'm going to put my national trade policy before a safe climate for the future of humanity that's exactly the kind of leap we need to make and mm. stop doing this short-termist national short-term trade-off mm. yeah i have a comment there i think that them that tax on the on the solar panel is not smart because, <laughs> 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 because the, the u.s <laughs> china just <laughs> began to import natural gas and oil from u.s uh, last year and that's a big ticket item, Yeah. right? So. Okay, that's a, yeah. One quick we get trend point. to point out <laughs> about national policy that's interesting. We managed to mine and get access to every installation of every kind of resource generation in America over time, thanks to Standard & Poor's data. And what's interesting is this is 1970, and pink and yellow is coal and natural gas. And if I play this forward in time, you'll see this unbelievable bloom happen in renewable, which is hmm. light green and dark green, starting, of course, in the 2000s. Wow. And what's interesting about that bloom is you can see it's in the central plains with wind, which makes sense, but it's all about policy. Because where do we have a whole lot of solar? North Carolina. Now, where do they have more sun than North Carolina? South Carolina. <laughs> in fact, the entire <laughs> south of the country, which has basically no solar. Mm. It's all about policy. Boston is a large area where you have unit scale mm. solar, and it's actually cloudy in Boston half the year. <laughs> So indeed, policy is what's driving this rather than rational thinking about megawatt production. That is fascinating. Um, on the policy front, I want to ask another China question. Um, <coughs> one of the things I, I think a lot about is, all right, so you have a financial sector, and I can chime in on this too if you want. You have a financial sector in China that's supported by the savings, the l l you know, large amount of savings of the Chinese people. It goes into state-owned banks. It gets funneled into state-owned enterprises. That is a big political economy Right. issue, right. and that has impact, of course, on these challenges. H okay, let me, let me collect that one a little bit. The, the people in China used to save a lot, but not anymore, yeah. because of the mortgage. Okay, not that much now. If you calculated that, taking out the mortgage, the, the average of household savings is very little now. But then you could substitute property through banks, state owned. I mean, it's still the same triangle well, of political and economic that interest. So yeah. how do you how do you break that so you can really shift to a? Well, at this moment, I don't believe that there will be some breaking in that in that cycles. Mm. But I do believe that government did realize the problems, okay, of the of the cycle, and they tried to reform uh, the financial sector, and that has been continuous for the last couple of years. Mm. 
and somebody told me it will, be, it will continue this year. So somehow that will still be able, and also that the still enterprise reform also ongoing right now. So maybe in about two years' time, we can see a better result of, of black cycle. Ken, what do you but, think? But so the problem here, of course, is the Chinese government's very forward-looking, but it lives in the moment. And if growth <coughs> slows down a lot, yeah. uh, the debt bombs will blow up. Yeah. It'll create incredible political pressures. They really, really, really don't want that. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's part of why. I mean, it's the pushback against pollution has been going for, on for a long time in China, mm -hmm. and yet they have trouble containing it yeah. because, you know, well, this, this, they, they, this, we put in uh, clean coal, we, right. we put in something so that the plants are, are cleaner, but that turns out to hurt the growth of the production, so they just turn off the switches and mm -hmm. people seem to look the other way. It's um, very difficult politically mm. to, to do that when you know you feel like you might uh, lose control, yeah, and, lose power, and a trade war. And, and, it, and it's hard. It's hard for uh, national governments also. You really ha have to educate people. Have enormous mm. push. I think there is among young people, but not all young people. I mean, I think the you know there there are a lot who uh, really don't know much about it would benefit from having five minutes with a graph like this, uh, mm. they could get it. Kate, you wanna? These points you were just making about if growth slows down, then the debt bomb goes off. And also, if any country's growth slows down, that country risks being kicked out of the G20 family photo, right? No country wants to lose their place in the G20. If you're not growing, you can get booted out by the next powerhouse. These are examples of political lock-ins to un unending growth. We're financially locked in through money being created as debt bearing interest through the stock market which pursues the highest rate of return we're socially locked in mm. through a century of mass consumerism that tells us we improve ourselves by buying something more to mm. me these are some of the most powerful ways in which we are financially politically and socially structurally dependent upon and then ending growth mm. and this is exactly where the rubber hits the road when how do you protect the living planet on which everything in us depends when we've got these institutions that have no, no plans on changing. To me, these are the economic questions of the 21st century. How do we take that endless growth bug out of our political and financial institutions so that, strange though it sounds, we can have economies that come to thrive without endlessly growing? We don't even begin to know what that would look like. Uh, that is an interesting uh, concept. I have a small comment. Uh, sure. I think that at this moment, 6.5 to 7% 6 of growth in China, the government and also the people in China consider it very comfortable, uh, mm. as long as they don't fall down too much. Mm. And also, we also don't believe it should go up too much. Uh -huh. So you feel uh, you're at a comfortable Go back to the energy, go back to the coal, go back to environmental impact. And also, China has reached a stage that something needs to be done on the environment. Yeah. That's also related to income, yeah. overall income increase. Yeah. Well, and that gets to this point about yeah. that billionaire belt, which was so striking. Um, right. uh, I, I just before I open it up to questions, are there any, for all of you, any surprises here that you've seen in terms of the graphics? Anything that you'd like to see um, collated uh, that you think would be meaningful for this discussion? Well, I mean, I guess I think it would be, inter you may have it, you probably do, but something about you know, measures of per capita consumption in different places to capture the obscenity of the consumption in the West yeah. where there, yes, there's inequality, but they're rich. It's a rich mm -hmm. person's discussion mm -hmm. compared to the poverty question that's in much of the world. Mm. I guess you have the nutrition maps mm -hmm. that certainly mm -hmm. capture that. I think I would like to see the ecological uh, <coughs> footprint, yeah. right, yeah. yeah. Because, right. Um, Kate, There's one map actually perhaps we could show because it's a very profoundly striking one, which is the global flow of refugees. Uh, um, of course, we're looking back at history when we look at the global flow of refugees. And so this is from uh, 2000. So you see refugees from uh, Sri Lanka now starting coming from Sri Lanka. You see people, many refugee flows through Africa, from uh, Iraq. A lot of people going to Germany. <laughs> Ukraine will suddenly burst. You'll see that suddenly burst. But this is historic refugees. Many of these conflicts over fossil fuel yeah. mining. Yeah. In the future, I think, as we were saying, we're going to see more flows of refugees as a result of fossil fuel burning, people fleeing from places where climate change has made it uninhabitable. Mm. 
we are so globally connected. This is why we need an economics of the planet. Mm. Yeah. All right, um, I want to open it up to questions now. Um, and feel free to ask the panelists anything or if you have data requests that you'd like uh, Ila to pull up. Any questions? Oops, over there. We have a microphone coming yeah, in. Yeah, we'll like to get a mic please. coming in. Just introduce yourself, please. Thank you. So I'm Ajay. I'm a farmer from India. And when you look at these maps, it actually makes people, I mean, it makes me as an Indian or if I was in China feel guilty about a growth level. But look at where we're starting from, you know. I mean, they, we do not have an, the governments do not have an alternative because they need to find jobs for an aspirational generation, <laughs> which if they do not find it, it's, it's going to have more devastating implications for the, for the government and democracies as such. Mm -hmm. And how do you progress in, 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 a, in a world which is so competitive without having to focus on growth? It's, it's very difficult for governments to understand. Mm -hmm. And jobs, creating jobs for the jobless, creating employment, I think so, is the only focus that is required that everyone's looking at. Do you all want to? I'd ahead. love to jump in. I, I was doing everything I could in the use of the maps to not imply uh, that there's a problem with growth in India or low-income countries. <coughs> I believe that's exactly where economic growth is needed if it's translated into health, education, uh, infrastructure that gets everybody out of poverty. The growth that keeps me awake at night, and it sounds like also on the panel, mm -hmm. is the endless growth that we saw in high-income countries like where I come from, where uh, no matter how wealthy a country is, its economy is still structured to demand and expect and depend upon unending growth. To me, that's the real challenge. So we absolutely need a growth in countries where people's needs are not, not, most bet, you, m not yet met. That is what an economy should be growing for, to meet the needs of all. How do we then reconcile that with the fact that if it grows endlessly, we go way over the means of the planet? Could I just ask if we go back to that map of changing electricity use? Because I did want to jump in on a comment there, and it connects to this. Um, it was the global map of, uh, the multicolored map of, of how electricity, the, night, the lights at night had gone up and down, and we saw a rise in China, but a fall in the US. Um, and what, was, what that map was masking, okay, so we, this is a map of change. And whenever you see a map of change, you have to ask about levels as well. What I'm guessing this shows, okay, we're seeing an increase in China of electricity use and a fall or a, or a stabilization in the US, but if we were looking at levels per capita, the US would be way above China. It would be yeah. way above India. So it's really important to look at levels and not just change. Do you have levels that we can pull up? No. no not yet. Next year. You Next found year. something I don't have. OK, good. All right, excellent. Uh, let's see, question over here. Hi, uh, Tim Donatera, Alpha. So one of the things, and, you know, I hear your message, and I believe in exactly what you're saying, but we have to provide paths of success for people, which you want to provide, of course we all want to provide. I think when going back to the global footprint comment at the beginning, there are examples of countries that have both high economic, traditional measures of e economic success per capita income, and actually are living largely within their global sustainability footprint. You know, a few, in Denmark, I think is an example. Down. Well, I think they are actually <laughs> under 1%, one. They're not at 1.7 where the world is, they're more like at one. So do you have any maps showing kind of at a, because Global Footprint Network has that data that shows at least a path to a successful economies that are mm. more balanced and that maybe can offer opportunities for how development can happen in a way that fits the global needs? I, I'll look, I don't think we have that kind of global data, but I'd like to give you a card because we'd love to add that. This is an open source <laughs> platform, so we're always mm. willing to add more data. Yeah, yeah and actually, um, do we have um, a place where folks can access this, uh, this We do. When this, uh, conversation is over. In fact, you can play with this interface yourself. We'll have a few minutes free for that. And we can give you a card so that you can access it, yes. Okay. I've, can I've I just add, I don't believe there are any countries in the world that are considered high income or well off that live anything like within their ecological footprint means. Uh, you, you get a storyline where as countries get richer, they just totally yeah. bypass that box. It, yeah, I was gonna agree. You have to think of consumption, not production. Mm -hmm. So if you're not manufacturing the high pollution mm -hmm. things yeah. and they're in China, then it looks right. like well, you know, we're really doing nothing. There are a lot of bicycles in Copenhagen, but I doubt <laughs> they, you know, I, I, I agree with Kate. Let me ask, before we take another question, let me just ask you all to build on, 
you know, where is the low-hanging fruit from a policy lever standpoint in terms of shifting to what Kate's talking about, a new kind of economics in which, um, you know, uh, endless growth is not the measure? Where, where, where do you see I that? I mean, a global carbon tax would be a great place to start. Mm. I, that, you go across economists of different, you know, political stripes, everyone agrees about mm. that. I've certainly, I, th I think over the years, you occasionally get asked at Davos to say, well, if you had one policy you could put uh, in place, and I've certainly listed that several times, mm -hmm. but uh, the political appetite, when I've said that to various, certainly American political leaders, their faces just grimace, yeah. you know, at the <laughs> idea. Can I have one low-hanging fruit? I would make it in the first economics lecture of any student in high school or in Econ mm. 101. I wouldn't begin economics education with supply and demand, which yeah. suddenly talks about the market as if it was an equilibrium. I would start by drawing the economy within the living world. That is mm. a radical act. Mm. Recognizing the economy is a subset of the living world utterly dependent upon it, and it's about creating a thriving balance. And to me, if we start there, it's an utterly different mindset that takes us to these questions straight away. I think that's really powerful. Yeah. Professor I think that is a, is a kind of a difficult. Yes, there are some policies that will work, but in reality, it's difficult to, to. For example, let's say, if you talk to Chinese people 20 years ago, say, let's go for environment. It'll be very difficult, sure. as compared to what it is today. Well, but, it's almost melting. Right, right, so, so what I believe that, let's try step by step. Yeah. For example, we're gonna begin carbon trade. Let's see what, how carbon trade will happen. This will be largest carbon market in the world. Let's see what happens. Mm. Okay, uh, let me take a question in the back there, mm -hmm. and then we'll come up front again. Yeah, we did this amazing work with the World Economic Forum on the future of production, and um, if you look at what you can automate with today's technology, it's already 50% of all the tasks that we are doing worldwide. So if you, if you say we are going into a direction with less growth, maybe, to, to be more sustainable, um, have you looked at the impact on employment and layering this, this over with kind of the automation challenge we are looking at and mm. that will really come through technology? That's a great question. Why? Okay. Um, I, I'll kick off by saying mm. the scale of the automation challenge is such that no amount of economic growth could counter it. So pursuing growth as a cure for automation would never work. Mm. We have to, again, it's a mind shift. But I, going back to the carbon tax point, resource taxes, right? Economy, uh, policymakers traditionally, because economics is focused on labor productivity, Adam Smith and Ricardo focused on labor productivity, thinking that actually there was enough land, we'll, we'll focus on labor productivity. We end up with taxes that tax companies for hiring people, we tax, right, which is crazy. Companies are taxed for, work, for hiring people, they're penalized. Mm. Whereas they're often subsidized through depreciation allowances for using resources. It should be the other way around. Mm -hmm. We should shift from labor taxes to taxing resources, including carbon. Now, if we started there, what would happen to this drive to automate everything? If we truly costed the energy cost and the resource use that's going into this automation, I think the story might begin to change. And Kate, let me follow up on that. There's something really interesting that Standard & Poor's did with us. In fact, there's some sessions on this in the global situation space down the stairs. But they did an evaluation going to 2050 of the impact of a high carbon tax on the profit at risk that companies face by sector. Uh -huh. And what they found is outstandingly large risk across mining, automobiles, electric utilities, chemical, telecom. What's powerful about that is it shows the motivating influence that a high carbon tax can have on innovation to create more renewable processes within companies. Because in some cases, 300, 600, 700 percent of their EBIT is actually at risk by 2050, just based on a carbon tax. So wow. this is an incredibly powerful uh, catalyst with which we can make change. Can you run us through the colors really quick? Because that's for, so mining is yellow. Yes, I'll play forward in time so you yeah. can see how rapidly it rises. But in fact, uh, the colors shown on the right, the red is chemical industries. Okay. Um, and the brown is automobile and mining. Mining has huge impact from, from carbon tax, which makes sense. What's the blue? Electric utilities. And what you see from that is variegation. The electric utility cost in France, actually, in terms of carbon tax, is very, very high indeed. I mean, if the diet is a big sustainability issue, you yeah. just can't feed the whole world. It's right. impossible with the resources based on the American diet. It's not mm. possible. Right. Yeah. So some evolution. Uh, even in the relatively near term has to take place and over the longer run, mm -hmm. 
there's, you know, there's no way to ma even maintain it, the current status quo. Yeah, we, I often, uh, you know, together with my students, uh, wondering, U.S., 40% of electricity <coughs> consumed by households, okay? Mm. China, 12% for, to 13% consumed by households. U.S. population is what, what one-fourth mm. of China. The electricity system is roughly the about size of China. How do you guys consume? They have no clue. Yeah. <laughs> you really have no clue. Yeah. You, you, you're, you're welcome to visit. <laughs> always going around turning the lights out. Um, <laughs> question here. Uh, Chris Giles from the Financial Times. Um, just we, we, in the last decade, we've had a natural experiment of lower growth, which was unexpected and unwanted. And a decade on, We've now got populist governments in the U.S., populist uh, uprisings in Europe in advanced economies, and people are miserable. And in the World Economic Forum, we're talking about a fractured world. So I was going to ask the panel how, if we're going to have less growth after we've just had a decade mm. of low growth, that's going to make the world a better place. Great question. Mm. Kate, you want I'm to happy that? to jump in on that. What we just had is low growth in economies that are structurally designed for growth. So, of course, when growth doesn't come in economies that depend upon it, it's a disaster. I'm talking about something very different. I'm talking about making the leap of structuring economies so that they don't financially, politically, and socially depend upon unending growth. Because in nature, which is a pretty good model for us to learn from, nature's been around for 3.8 billion years, so if we want to thrive, we should learn from nature. Nothing in nature grows forever. In fact, if things try to grow forever, in our own bodies, we recognize that as cancer. Things that grow forever within a thriving living system destroy the host on which they depend. Mm. So there's a, there's a bigger challenge there. And so I'm not talking about let's just stop growth in economies that are structured to depend on upon it. That's a crisis and a disaster, and it undermines people's well-being. I'm talking about reimagining the foundations of our economies that have been designed as if endless growth was possible, where there's absolutely no evidence that we can mm. reconcile that with a living planet. I mean, I'm, I'm not so sure that we have to have no growth as we have to have different growth, and it mm -hmm. depends on measurement. Mm -hmm. Certainly the kind of growth we've had in that yeah. direction is not sustainable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I can well imagine the, the economy evolving in other directions where there's growth in uh, things which are less energy mm -hmm. intensive, which are less, uh, you know, consuming mm -hmm. of different resources. Mm -hmm. So. I, I don't think this is necessarily, you know, has to say we can't have economies grow, but I mean, you sort of said externalities isn't enough to say, but it says a lot. The I mean, we're not paying for, we're not paying, we're, we're not paying for the externalities. We're not <laughs> taking it into account. And if we did, like a carbon tax does, it's a big help. It would go a long ways. Uh, Professor, the uh, last word yeah, to you, and then I'm going to Yes, I, I was still that uh, by being in China for such a dynamic times, I still believe that to change in the pattern of uh, growth first and environmental later is quite difficult even at this point. But by understanding this, we can do better. Yeah. Because uh, we now in China, we begin to realize that this is not going to be sustainable. <coughs> we begin to look back, can we do better? Mm. And we certainly believe we can do better. Yeah. If along the way, we can understand this much earlier. Yeah. Than, than well, what, China uh, is yeah. certainly a great case study right. in course correction and the ability right. to do that. Right. So let me just summarize. We've got a minute or so left. Um, first of all, thank you to all of you. Amazing presentation. What I'm hearing, I think some of the key takeaways are, um, Ken, you keep pointing out it's all relative. We need to have a conversation that isn't just one conversation about inequality, but to tease that out. Uh, on a national basis. It's all interlinked. I mean, some of the patterns, um, really, of all, basically all the world's challenges, you know, mm -hmm. are right here on these maps. Um, change is possible. I was really struck by some of the good news uh, graphics that you put up, and maybe maybe one or two more of those for next year. <laughs> um, and, and policy matters, which is also a hopeful thing. So um, I will end on that note. I will thank all the panelists, and thanks to you all for being here. <laughs>